using your corporation as your retirement fund. So this is a good opportunity for us entrepreneurs. I'm going to explain this to you in basic terms. I know it's a complicated topic, but I'm going to give you just the basic overview so that you can make smart decisions about how to, how to do all this. And your accountant may give you all kinds of complicated terms. I am just going to explain to you just so that you can understand um, how to use it effectively in your case. So using your corporation as your retirement fund, that's our topic for today. What we're going to learn today is why, why you should invest in your corporation. It's a good opportunity. I explain why that is. Also, you know, when you go saving for your retirement, you can invest inside your corporation or in RSP or TFSA. So what is better for you? And I'm going to go through that. Uh, and then I can talk about how to invest, how investment in this corporation, how investment income is taxed in a corporation. Now, I'm going to give you in very brief with the technical rules, just so you understand, so you hear what they are. But I'm going to give you a simple explanation, ignore the technical stuff, a simple explanation, so you understand it. So uh, then I'm going to talk about tax-efficient investing and how to do that. And I have some inv advanced investment strategies for business owners that you might find cool. And then I'm going to talk about just retirement planning in general for business owners and how you can think about it. So, all right. So why should you um, invest in your corporation? So here's basically why. You get a tax deferral of about 31% by investing in your corporation. So whether you pay a salary or dividend, I usually recommend dividend because you don't have to pay the CVP. But you know, so you make a profit in your company, you pay 12% tax on it and you pay it out to yourself as a dividend. You pay 31% and then it's 43% total. So if you leave it in your company, you pay this 12%, but you avoid the 31. And that's why you should do it. And it works out the same if you do a salary because you pay, 12% tax. When you pay it out to yourself as a salary, the corporation gets it back because the salary is an expense. And then you pay, you know, let's say, 43% tax on it personally. So that's, again, 31% tax. So you're you're deferring that. Of course, you got to pay it sometime down the road when you take the money out of the corporation. But meanwhile, you get to defer it and you get that extra money and you can invest it and you get to keep the growth on that, that over time. So that's why you should look at investing inside your corporation. Now, you know, most people use RSPs as a tax deferral. You can use a corporation. So let's compare them. They're both tax deferrals, but they're different. Okay. So RSP, you know, you put money into an RSP, you get a, you get a refund on it based on whatever your personal marginal tax bracket is, right? In the corporation, you're, you're deferring 31% tax on it. And this RSP, remember, this refund is a deferral too, because you, you are going to have to pay tax on that somewhere in the future when you take the money back out. Now, RSP, there is a limit. You can only do 18% of your earned income. But with a corporation, there is no income, uh, no, no um, maximum. You could, in theory, leave all of your corporate income in your corporation, and you defer that 31% tax on all of it. So it can be a much bigger deferral. So now if you have investment income in an RSP, in an RSP that's also deferred, but a corporation that's not, you have to pay this really high tax on, which I'll explain in a minute. So in the end, you end up paying tax personally on it. So you don't get a deferral on the taxable income. So you're trying to avoid taxable income. In RSP, now the, there are requirements that you have to start paying it out. Like at some point you convert it to a RIF, maybe when you retire, but by 72, you have to start taking money out and there are minimums, okay? In a corporation, uh, there are no payout requirements. There's no minimums. You can, you can leave it in as long as you want. You can take it out whenever you decide. So there's pros and cons to the two of them. Overall, RSP is a better deferral. It's uh, in most cases, it's a bigger amount that you get. However, this the corporation could be a bigger deferral. So that's how I compare these two deferrals. So now the question is, you, you have some money in your corporation. Should you just invest it in the corporation or should you pay it out to yourself and then either put an RSP or TFSA, what is better? Now, a general rule of thumb, and I'll explain this in a minute, is usually taking money out uh, to put an RSP is number one. 
Number two is investing in the corporation. And number three is TFSA. That's the general rule. And I'll explain why that is meant. There's lots of different variations that may affect all that based on your plan and your tax brackets. But that is the general rule. So now the reason for that is, let's say you withdraw, you take money out of your RSP. Now, usually I recommend dividends. When you take money out, for most for most the business owners, if you own the corporation or just you and your spouse and there's no outside people, you mostly want to take just dividends be, because you avoid the CPP, which is, uh, you know, you have to pay like 11% of your income into, this, into the CPP because you pay, have to pay um, uh, the uh, employers and employees share of it. So because of that, that's a bigger difference than any tax difference. So you mostly want to pay yourself a dividend. Okay. Now, if you pay yourself a dividend from the company and put it in RSP, you're basic. You're usually saving tax about seven percent. So you put the money, you get an extra seven percent amount, and then it's in the RSP, and it's generally a bit more effective deferral than in the corporation. So usually, taking money out to put in RSP is worthwhile. Now, remember, when you're paying yourself dividends, you don't get any new RSP room at all. Okay. So whatever RSP room you have is all you get. It's worth taking enough out of the company, max your RSP once, and that's it. You don't get any more room, okay? So in your corporation, there will be some tax. Uh, even with tax-efficient investments, you get some tax. So that's why RSP is generally a bit better than deferral. Now, TFSA, TFSA is actually really cool because you don't pay any tax at all. It's, it's actually kind of cool. But you know, taking money out of the corporation to put in your TFSA is generally not worthwhile because you're losing that 31% tax deferral. Like you have to pay tax on the dividend and then you put that money in your TFSA, you end up with 20 to 40% less to invest, right? Well, if you put it into RSP, generally you get about 7% more to invest and you get a bit better deferral. So that's why RSP is generally a bit better than investing in corporation and TFSA is generally a bit worse. Now let's talk about, so now when you're investing in your corporation, let's understand how the investment income is. So what happens is there is a there is a punitively high tax on investment income in a corporation, okay? So, and you, there's a way to deal with it, but you have to understand what this is. So generally it's taxed about 50.2%, it varies by province, but you pay 50% tax on it. So you make 100,000 profit in your company, you leave it in the company, you pay 50,000 of tax, you have 100,000 investment income in there. You pay 50,000 of tax on it. Um, the um, Now, once you take that out personally, you get 30% of it back, so you're only paying 20%. So that's the 31% you get back when you when you uh, pay it out. And basically, you got to pay it out once, once you have taxable investment. So you end up paying it out to yourself to avoid this really high 50% tax. So 50% tax is there not, it's too high for you to ever want to pay it. So that's why any investment income you get, you always pay it out to yourself. You pay personal tax on the investment income. And that way you don't ever have to pay this 50% tax. So now I'm going to give you the complicated, the actual rules, the basic, the basic ones. And then I'm going to explain how this works in real simple terms. But I'm giving you these because your accountant's going to use these terms and you got to know what the hell he's talking about. So he's going to talk about the RDTOH, which means refundable dividend tax on hand. Now there are, right now, the main one is the eligible one when you're investing because the eligible amounts is what you get from, from your outside investments, okay? Now there's a new one and an ineligible one. I won't get into that. There's complications for this, but this is the main one for it when you're investing. So just the big picture of how it works is uh, essentially 30.67% of of uh, half of your capital gains or all of your interest or all of your foreign dividends goes into this one refundable dividend tax on hand. If you get dividends from Canadian companies, it's 38%. So money gets allocated into this. Uh, okay, so you're paying this high dividend tax rate of 50%, 50 percent 50.2. But then this that includes this amount here. Now what happens is the... Um, uh, you pay that out to yourself. And for every dollar of dividend you pay to yourself, you get $2.61 per, 
um, uh, sorry, um, you refunded a dollar for every two sixty two dollars and sixty one cents that you pay out to yourself. So basically, you know, you got you make a hundred thousand dollar dividend, you just pay out the hundred thousand to yourself, and you get that money back. It's essentially how it works. So now the other one your accountant's going to talk about is the CDA, capital dividend account. So what is that? Basic. So basically, you know, capital gains are ta are only half of capital gains are taxable. So the capital dividend account is the free half. So half goes in as regular investment income taxed at their investment income rate, 50%. The other half goes in to this capital dividend account and can be paid out tax-free. So capital dividend account is cool. So it's all tax-free. Now, normally you want to pay it out right away. Why? Because let's say the next year, you show a capital loss on your investments in your company, it reduces your capital, your CDA, and you can't take that money out tax-free. So usually, um, you know, you even though that amount is all tax-free, you want to take it out right away as well. So, now, so those are the complicated rules, RDTOH and CDA. Here is just what you, you don't really need to understand all those. You just need to understand the basic picture. So, the basic picture is you pay a dividend to yourself for all the investment income. So you have investments in your company, you're, you're going to try to avoid taxable income. But when you get some, you just pay it out to yourself and you pay taxable pack, taxable income personally on it. Okay, that's way, that way you get the 30.7% back on the investment income. And also you get your the free amount of the, uh, of the, uh, from the capital gains. So whatever investment income is, you just pay it. You never pay the 50%. You just withdraw the whole amount and pay tax on it personally at whatever your personal rate is on investment income, which is much usually much lower than 50%. Okay, So that way you avoid the 50% on passive income. You pay tax personally as an ineligible dividend as you take it out of your company. So investment income equals pay tax personally. So you have investment income in your company, you just always pay it out to yourself as a dividend, you pay tax and you tax personally on it. So, all right. Now, what that does is, so remember we got the 31% tax deferral by leaving money in the company. So that 31% you're gonna lose be, based on the amount of investment income. And that's why you wanna invest it tax efficiently. Like you, you invest 100,000, you get 10,000 taxable income. You have to take that 10,000 out. Now you've lost that 31% deferral. So it's better to try to defer the tax. Okay. So that's the big picture of investment income, how it's taxed. And that's this is really all you need to know. Whatever dividend, what investments in income you have, you just pay it out. And you invest, and there's reasons to invest tax efficiently. If all you know is that, th then you know the, the key points. So let's talk about investing inside your corporation. So the investment income, remember, is taxed at 50% roughly. It varies a bit by province. Um, you need to pay it out to yourself so you pay tax on it personally. And it's important to invest tax efficiently. And you might need a holding corporation. I talked about that in my video last week about why you might, might need it if you're operating company can get this, you know, 900,000 tax-free capital gain on this when you sell your operating company. So, all right. So when you do this, basically your corporation becomes your retirement fund. You're not using, you, know, you max out your RSP once, it's the end of your RSP. And, and this is now your main retirement fund that you're investing inside your corporation. Now, the biggest mistake that I see by business owners talk to lots of them and this is what i see a lot of times surprisingly business owners are always taking risks with their business all the time and yet when it comes to investments for some crazy reason they often think they need to to invest it conservatively and the thinking is this is the this is the wrong thinking they think i work really hard for my money and i don't want to lose it so that's why they put it you know they'll They'll take all kinds of risks to invest in, and make and make uh, with a business and make money, and then they'll put it into a savings account. And I think, why would you do that? Because you're working hard. Now your money needs to invest work hard too. It's like having teenagers that lie on the couch instead of go out and mow the lawn. You know, it's you have, you want to you want your money to work hard for you. So, okay, so now here is a here is just so you understand what it is. I've done. Or, 
you know, way over a thousand financial plans for people. And here's what you may find really surprising. So when you when you save up money for retirement and retire, more than half of your retirement income, you can be retired for 30 years or more, more than half of it is the growth you get on your investments after you retire. That's and that's maybe shocking to you, but that's why it's really important to always invest for long-term growth, like before and after you retire, you keep investing for growth. That's the secret to retiring comfortably. So, and now you're a business owner, right? You should believe in business. You should believe in equity investing because equity investing, you're investing in, in stocks, which are companies, which are businesses, right? So you believe in investing in businesses. Now, when you get when you have profit, you should invest it in other businesses that also make money. That's how you keep growing. So bottom line is invest, always invest for long-term growth. So now it's important to invest tax efficiently. How the hell do you do that? So now here's what you do. So first of all, you should focus on equity. Remember equities, again, stock market, they're big companies that you're investing in. And the higher the proportion is, the better. Now, you need to be invest within your risk tolerance. You know, so, but, you know, risk tolerance is a learned skill. You can get knowledgeable on the stock market over the long term and you get, you can learn to invest at a higher amount. So the higher amount, the better. Ideally, it's 100%. You put in equities. So now so, some people invest in dividend stocks specifically because they think it's their safer stocks and they're getting this regular income from it. But you know what? Uh, it's actually not tax efficient at all because you get all these dividends. So now, so basically we're trying to avoid dividends. Now, when you invest in companies, in, in equities, you can't avoid dividends. All right, because, you know, almost like 90% of companies pay dividends. But basically what you're trying not to do is buy, buy choose your investments because they pay dividends or because the dividends are high. You want to just buy and, and invest based on companies that are going to uh, with the longest, you know, the highest total long-term return is what you're really looking for. And ideally what you want is, is long-term growth. Now, when it comes to, um, oh, sorry, when it comes to um, um, tax efficient investing, I think a lot of dividend investors think their dividends are tax efficient. And you know what, they're taxed at lower rates if you buy Canadian dividends, but not really in a Canadian company either. So, but, but, so that's the kind of wrong thinking. But what's actually the, the lowest taxed capital, the lowest tax type of investment income, I have an article on my blog, you can search my blog for it. The lowest tax type of investment income is deferred capital gains. Remember, capital gains have a preferred rate to only pay tax on half of it. But you know, if you pay tax on of it 10 or 20 years from now, that is taxed at a lower rate than any other kind of investment income. So it's, it's deferring it, that is the secret. So now when you're buying these equities, you, you want to do something where you're, you want to minimize trading because you've traded a lot, you trigger a lot of capital gains. So for the most part, you're trying to buy an investment that's going to grow over time and, and that you could just hold and not something that you're trading for all the time. So now in general, buying an ETF or an index fund is a fairly good way because they tend to have not a lot of trading and you don't get a lot of taxable distributions like T3 or T5 slips from it. So it's generally a fairly good way to invest. Uh, I put this as singular because my view of ETF or index fund investing is that buying one might be decent, but buying two or more is probably dumb. So basically you want to buy like an MSCI World Index ETF or index fund or a S&P 500, which is the US or a combination of the two. So, but you don't want to try to pick specific sectors and industries and get into all these exotic ones, because the more you do that, it's you're trying to make predictions. And basically, you're going to do it based on what's, you know, what has done well in the recent past instead of what's going to do well in the future. So you're probably going to make, you know, dumb and dumb decisions that way. So better, you should just invest in, you know, a good index fund. The other option, which is one that I do personally through our por portfolio managers, is uh, corporate class mutual funds. And actually, I'm bringing this up because I have a specific question from my blog about this. So are they good investments? And yeah, so they're still actually pretty tax efficient. So, you know, it used to be up till a few years ago 
that uh, corporate class of mutual funds were actually quite a good investment because you could switch between them without tra without uh, triggering any tax. So you could you know have a U.S. fund and switch to a Canadian, switch to an international, and you could switch to a sector fund and whatever, and, and you didn't trigger any tax. That's gone now. However, uh, you still get lower distributions. So similar to an ETF or next fund, you get lower distributions with a, with a corporate class mutual fund, and here. You're getting a fund manager. If you get a really good fund manager, he can beat the index even after fees and you can outperform it. If you get a run of the mill fund manager, they're going to lag it. So what corporate cost mutual funds do is, you know, a company can have, you know, 30 or 50 different funds that are all technically in one corporation and they can allocate the taxable income from the one that grows to the one that doesn't. For example, let's say technology has a Great year and resources, you know, our dad have a lousy like year like they did last year. So then what happens is you get big distributions in the corporate in the, uh, the technology fund, but you don't have any in the other in the uh, in the resource fund. So they can take the capital gains here and they can allocate them to those other investors, and you end up paying a lot less tax overall. You know, the year end distributions that you get tend to be a lot smaller in corporate class mutual fund. So it's still a tax efficient way to invest. So those are kind of the best methods that you can, you know, for investing tax efficiently. Now, here is where you may get bad advice. Your financial advisor who may sell insurance and also your accountant will tend to recommend insurance policies. And for the most part, they're actually not a good choice. Okay, so here's why. Because for, you know, like, they're recommended because of some tax savings. But, you know, to do this, you're buying a universal life or a whole life policy. And these are, you know, permanent insurance, insurance for life. And you're paying for that insurance, whether you need it or not. You know, most people don't actually need permanent insurance. They need it while they're working because if something happened to them, they want to know their spouse and their family are going to be okay. All right. But most people don't need it for, for, for life. So you're probably paying for insurance that you don't need, especially as you get older when you do that. So, Also, um, you get tax-free growth. So you buy these universal life policies, you get tax-free growth, but only if you don't touch it. So it's not tax-free growth for you. It's only tax-free growth if you never touch this stuff and you leave it for your kids. So it's for the kids only. Right. Okay. So you get the tax free growth. And, you know, it's so the reason your accountant will like it is you put money into a universal life policy. You don't pay any tax on the growth as it grows. And then when you die, it goes to your kids tax free. There hasn't been any tax in all this time. So that's all. Oh, so accountants will look at all that. But accountants tend not to be good investors and they miss the, the investment part of it. So, um, and so now usually we're investing in the corporation because it provides for your retirement, okay? And if you take any money out of this investment, it's actually, you have to actually pay tax on it. And, and those, you know, you're paying all the full investment income at the, at the you know, these, these problems, these higher rates, okay? So that's why you, you just generally don't want to have these policies are, are not effective for you if the money is for you as for your, as part of your retirement. So the other big thing is that investment wise, it's it's kind of a screw up because what happens is instead of being able to invest in all the different investments out there, if you're buying a universal life policy, you're limited to investments of one insurance company. And they're usually segregated funds which tend to have you know a bit higher fees, maybe and and, but the biggest issue is actually, it used to be higher fees. The biggest issue now is usually a limited investment choice. So now the investment principle that you need to remember in all cases is never let the tax tail wag the investment dog. So your invest, your accountant will tend to be very conservative and just recommend some way to save tax. But usually the most the effective thing to do is focus on investing effectively and then try to minimize tax on that investment. Don't start with how do I min how do I pay minimum tax and then try to re re, you know do not too bad investing you know with minimum tax. Start with the most of uh, uh, the bigger investment because that's really where the big where the you know it benefits you the the investment growth long term is going to invest you 
benefit you more than the tax savings. So now there are some advanced save strategies. Now these are not for everybody, but you're investing inside your corporation. How do you like make this really bigger? And there's a couple of really cool strategies that can actually take you to the next level. And here's what they are. One of them is just an investment loan. So you can get, you know, a three for, three for one on a loan or something. So you're starting to save up money in the company. You save up 100000 You can get a company that'll lend you 300 You pledge 100000 and they'll send you, lend, lend you 300000 And now you've got 400000 You've got a bigger portfolio. And if it grows at, you know, 8 or 10 or 12% a year and you're paying 4 or 5% interest on it, it's a big plus to you. You're, it's a big gain over time. So it's a larger portfolio, which probably means if you do it right over the long term, it's a more comfortable retirement for you. So, all right. And the inter remember, the interest on it is tax deductible. You were trying to minimize taxable investments. So this offsets the investment income. All right. So that part, that actually makes it really useful. So the other one is to use an independent portfolio. This is a manager. This is a method that I use specifically myself, because if you if you choose a really good investment manager, you can get potentially higher returns from doing that. So they can invest in all kinds of things. So they can get a higher overall return. So the independent portfolio manager, this can actually this is something I do personally, and you can you can get higher returns by by doing this. So um, uh, all right, so. First of all, these are the elite investors in Canada. So most people are, you know, most of the investment industry, the stockbrokers, the mutual fund guys and insurance guys. But the independent portfolio managers are the only ones in the investment industry that have a fiduciary du duty to do what's in your best interest. All right. And by investing with them, you become, you are automatically an accredited investor, which means you have much wider investment choices. For example, you can buy hedge funds or private equity or things. Now, um, if you're, if he's doing it as part of an overall portfolio, so by being a client of an independent portfolio manager, you have access to these more advanced investments. So now the one problem with them is almost all these independent portfolio managers will insist on, you know, a, a 20 or 40% in bonds or fixed income. And because they're trying to maintain you as a long-term investment income because they're, because they're concerned about regulators and stuff. But in the end, you should ask for 100% equities. I know when we were searching for independent portfolio managers, we had to search around trying to find, we found two that do a, a, what I think is a, an exceptional portfolio that I expect to outperform the index over time. And, you know, they're, and they're also, they will do 100% equity portfolio for us. So it's not that easy to find a really good independent portfolio manager, but this is actually a really plus. And, you know, they'll charge you investment fees. So, however, those fees are all tax deductible. Remember, remember again, we're trying to be, they're going to offset um, both that plus the interest expense from borrowing to invest. They offset the investment income that you get so that you would otherwise have to pay 50% on it. So it allows you to leave more money in your company. So these fees are actually, you know, not nearly as, as negative as you may as you may think uh, if, if they're helping you get higher, you know, long-term rates of return on it. So now let's talk about retirement planning in, for, an, for a business owner. So now you're investing in your corporation, but you know, how much do you invest and how do you do, do all this? So, so basically, the concept is you take enough out of your corporation, usually as a dividend, for your personal lifestyle, and just leave all the rest of the money inside your company and invest in there. So that's the way, uh, you know, if you're doing this effectively, you may actually be able to invest a lot more than most people who aren't business owners. You could leave a, there's no limit how much you could leave in there, and you're deferring this amount of tax. So now the amount you take out, usually you're trying to stay in the lowest tax brackets. Now the lowest bracket is up to 44,000. And these numbers are, the, the, the numbers actually grossed up for tax purposes to be in the tax bracket, but it's a $44,000 cash dividend or an $80,000 is the second lowest bracket. So, so you're trying to take those out, those out. But let's say that it's you and your spouse together have a business. So 44,000 each, um, times two, and you only pay about 4,000 tax on it. So if you if you do that, 
um, sorry, you're going to get about 84,000 per year after tax. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's actually enough for their lifestyle, 84,000 after tax. If, you, if it's not enough, you go to the next bracket, 80,000 times two less 20,000 tax, you get 140,000 after tax and you leave all the rest of the money in your company. So it's as your company grows, you can move to the next higher bracket. But so that's the amount you take out, you leave all the rest in there. Now, if you have RSP room, it's usually worthwhile take take extra dividends to max out your RSP room once. You don't get any new room, but it's usually worth doing that when you get that extra 7% savings. And it's a, you know, generally a bit higher quality deferral that you're getting. And all the rest is invested inside your corporation. Now, once you retire, then what you do is, you know, how do you take money out? Again, you're trying not to trigger too much taxable income. What uses what's called self-made dividends inside your company. Now I have a whole article you can uh, you can look up search on my on my blog self-made dividends or look in the uh, must read section. So self-made dividends are the most tax efficient way to take cash flow from your investments with the least amount of tax. Remember when you retired, you're looking for cash flow, not necessarily income. Income is taxable. Cash flow is you know the money you need to live on. So self-made dividends, basically, you have this portfolio of investments, and you just sell enough of it for the retirement cash flow that you need, and you pay some capital gains by doing that, but that's going to be less tax than if you invested for dividends or interest or, or anything else. Okay, the other key part is you're investing in there. The question is, now it's going to allow you to retire early. How much do you actually need to invest to the retire? the way you want. And that's why you need a financial plan. Well, actually, you, you designate, you decide what is the lifestyle that you want to have when you retire. And when you once you look at this, how to do this all tax efficiently, you can figure out you know, how soon would you be able to get to the point where you can retire the way that you want. All right, so that's basically my talk. What we learned is, so why you should invest in your corporation, um, whether you should do in the investment, uh, invest in your corporation, RSP or TFSA. We learned how investment income is taxed and we you know both the technicals and the simple explanation. We learned how to invest tax efficiently and also some advanced uh, uh, investment strategies and how to plan for your retirement as business owners. So uh, to, to learn more, you can go to my blog, um, edremple.com or unconventionalwisdom.ca. Uh, hit strategies or services of contact. We have a free offer of 30-minute consult consultation if you want to just talk to us to see whether or not it makes sense to work together. And um, you can subscribe to our blog or YouTube channel. So if you enjoyed this video, thanks a lot for listening. And again, if you subscribe, Subscribe to my blog and YouTube video. We don't market to you in any way, but by subscribing, that means that whenever I do a video or an article, it gets sent directly to your email. All right, thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.